Hi everyone, this is Jason Birak of Wall Street for Mean Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Mean Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He is a charter, char- excuse me, he is a chartered financial analyst or CFA. He is the founder of 720 Global, which is a research firm for the global economy and investments. He's a partner now. This is recent with Real Investment Advice with Lance Roberts, who's been a guest on, on our show in the past. And Lance has a really popular investment radio show and investing blog as well. And he also writes the Unseen Newsletter. Michael Leibowitz, thank you for joining me again. Thank you for having me once again. Now, Michael, in the last month or so, we've had a lot of volatility in the stock market that really we haven't seen in years. The VIX, in a very short amount of time, it had a really big spike, I believe over 120%. And then uh, in one day, it dropped more than 20%. The VIX now is back below 20 So do you think then that that, that type of volatility spike in, is an anomaly or do you think that volatility in asset price stock market is is the new normal and back here to stay again? Uh, a little bit of both. So I, I think part of the reason the, the volatility spiked so much, especially on a couple given days, was that we now have a security or an instrument that is volatility. Volatility, implied volatility, used to be a uh, the result, the uh, the score of other things. Now it's actually a traded security, which introduces volatility into volatility that's not coming from an external source. So I think some of the spike in volatility was driven by volatility itself. That said. I, one of the things that I've been paying a lot of attention to is there's no doubt in my mind that this stock market is grossly overvalued, and history has given us enough examples of overvaluation to know that eventually, and that doesn't mean today or tomorrow, but eventually they correct. They regress back to their back to and, and many times below normal levels. So the question I've been pondering is how does this current, we'll call it a bubble or period of uh, grossly overvalued equity prices uh, normalize? And there's many ways it can happen, but I but I'm going to just boil it down to two kind of basic patterns. One is what we saw in 2006 through 2008, which I would call a rounded top, where the market for two for the better part of almost two years was rising and then falling, but but and with some volatility, but nothing massive. And in comparison, think about 1987, which uh, was a somewhat unique event, but nonetheless, it did give some warnings. But within a period of two months after the first warning signs were seen, the market was down significantly, um, and it was the biggest one-day drop down uh, 20, 25 percent in one day um, on the New York Stock Exchange. So the question is. Are we going to have something like the Great Depression was similar in 1987, where it just dropped suddenly? Um, but it did give warning. Um, so what I what I I'm thinking about are warnings. What are some of the warnings? Uh, the fix is definitely a warning sign, uh, and it's something that we sh- that we should heed. Now I think because the severity of the drop, it hasn't been that severe, but it's still been a 10 percent drop. On essentially what I would say is no real news, no real catalyst tells me that. There is something else going on, and that this is probably a sign, and a sign that we should heed that a topping process is in place. Uh, but again, you know, there's various types of tops, and this could be a topping process that lasts for a year and a half, and it can be one that that very sudden and catches many people off guard. Yeah, I've interviewed hedge fund manager Eric Townsend from the Macro Voices podcast. He hosts that, and I'm not sure if you listened mm-hmm. to that interview, but he thinks, you know, this could be. We have the Dow at, at 25,000 again. He thinks this could be a W-shaped topping process where there's, you know, false breakouts and people think, oh, you know, the, the stock bull market is back. That was only a tiny correction. And then, you know, another drop and then another raise and another drop. And then basically setting up mm-hmm. either for a double top, a triple top, or a uh, head and shoulders chart pattern where, you know, then... I, the I, I, right. No, I, w- I was going to say I absolutely agree. Now, how that plays out, no one quite knows. But if you look at 1987, what we saw was the market fell off significantly in August, two months before uh, the market really sold off. And it came back about uh, 75% of the way. And then it started trading off again. That was a double top. 
or a lower high. Well, if uh, it, and I think we are going to get a series. If we do get like yeah. a, tr- a double top or triple top or that W uh, before the big crash, you know, I don't think normally with those things, and at least in the past, Michael, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that those types of uh, topping patterns, they don't happen within a month or two. They take six months or a year, sometimes 18 months to two years to play out. It, it could be. And here, here's, here's, you got to think about the psychology of the market. For the last 10 years, the Fed has no uncertain terms told us that are here to protect markets. Uh, you remember a couple of years ago, uh, Fed Governor Bullard, Bullard basically stepped in when the market was down 10, 12 percent and said and reminded everyone that we have QE and we can use it. And this was a time when they were talking about reducing QE. Uh, and this has occurred on and on uh, in speeches. Uh, Bernanke has talked about the wealth of tech and how it's one of the Fed's greatest tools uh, in promoting stock prices. So investors know that when stock prices go on sale, that's the time you're supposed to buy. And it's that psychology that needs to be broken. And how it gets broken, I don't know. Uh, and whether it occurs like Eric thinks, which is very possible with, with a triple top type thing over a number of months or even possibly a year longer, or some very sharp moves that get people to rethink, um, re- rethink their, their, their thoughts on the market. I don't know. I, I think, but, but I think well, I, I was just gonna say I think what people need to understand is that there's a distinct possibility that we are in a topping process, and how it plays out is anyone's guess. But you should heed that advice, and if we do break out to much higher levels, maybe you get back in, uh, or you you allocate. Uh, more risk to the market. But I see no harm in letting this play out a little while you've taken some cards off the table. It doesn't mean you totally divest, but just take some cards off the table and either take more off the table or possibly add if it looks like this is just another stuttering before the next jolt higher. I think a lot of financial professionals are doing what you're saying, that they're they're uh, fading the rally, they're exiting positions, so on days when the market is up, they're selling. But uh, I term- think that's going on. But it can't but, but we know for a fact it's not going on in, in mass, right? Because only a, a, a very small percentage can get out without destroying the market. Yep. If, if everyone tried to get out at once, we know what's going to happen. So people may be saying that, but it's really a small, small percentage they're doing. And we are seeing days like today are a great example. The S&P was up, uh, I think it was at least 1%, and it closed uh, flat or maybe a few points higher. Uh, closed two points higher. Yesterday, the market was up over 1% and it closed half a percent lower. And that's what, you know, what's called in the business is pump and dump, where they try to push it up on lighter volume, which allows them to then sell more positions, um, at higher prices. And, and according to this interview on Thursday afternoon, February 22nd, slightly as the market, right around when the market is closed. So for our listeners out there who want us to say the date and time when, when we're recording, but you, that's an interesting point. You brought up, Michael, about the buy the dip mentality. So in order to break that psychology of buy the dip, I I think the correction, and this is just from educated guessing and studying other market behavior and seeing other markets, is that people's optimism would half flip. You'd have to have reverse in sentiment. So you'd have to see at least a 15% drop in stock. Because remember, we had a 10% correction and all the talking heads and a lot of market experts were going on uh, CNBC and Bloomberg and saying, well, this is a good buying opportunity. So there has to be a clear pain threshold of dropping where it's maybe the textbook definition, right, of a bear market is a 20% drop. That's the textbook definition. So I'm thinking it would mm-hmm. probably have to be at those level worse for the buy the dip mentality crowd uh, changes. It, it, very, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to disagree, but I would just say a change in sentiment in general. And that's a very vague statement. And who knows what could change sentiment? It could be that Powell's comes out and just blatantly says, we're not here to support the market. It could be something geopolitical. It could be, you know, something with North Korea. You know, it seems like, uh, trade, trade, uh, trade wars are heating up again with China, possibly. Uh, who knows what, but a change in sentiment. Um, or even social activities, the recent uh, school shooting. Who knows how that plays into this? Um, so, so it's really just pay, pay, pay attention to, to keep an eye out. Uh, for all the types of things that may change sentiment, that by the dip hasn't existed forever and it's not going to exist forever. Something will change that. And like you said, Jason, it will probably be the market and the market not 
uh, rallying and then falling back and harming those that bought the dip. No. So, uh, yeah. I w- Sorry, go ahead. No, no. So I, I think in this environment, you just have to pay close attention. No, you got to pay close attention. Go oh, ahead, Jake. Okay. Yeah, go I ahead. wanted you to finish your point, and then I was going to go back to a previous point you made because uh, I just remembered I, because I just remembered what I was going to say about uh, what you talked about with the VIX. So you talked about basically how the VIX has created extra volatility. It's basically become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I was going to ask you then about this leverage short volatility trade because talked about central uh, central banks. I mean, central bank, they Ben Bernanke with the time end of the year cover, a lot of the people in the mainstream say, uh, whether they're on Wall Street or regular people, think that the central bankers, and I'm using air quotes, save the economy. I have one troll uh, on my most recent interview I released with Doug Nolan from Credit Bubble Bulletin saying that he, he apparently is not familiar with almost my thousand other videos where I just har- very harshly criticize central bankers for doing any intervention in bailouts. I think it's immoral, unethical, and I think central banks should basically be ended. But, you know, these guys have basically created They've boarded markets. They've created moral hazard. They've they've destroyed basic uh, supply and demand of a lot of markets and price cover. And so, you know, with the VIC, there's evidence there that I don't know if the central banks, Michael, started the manipulation with this leverage short volatility trade in the VIX, but whoever started it, it's morphed into like the most overcrowded trade on Wall Street now. So this self-fulfilling prophecy, like you said, this buy the dip, VIX is definitely attached into there. Because every time the VIC, you know, spike, there's that leverage short volatility trade crowd that has made money, easy money off of this trade for seven or eight years now that says, okay, the markets are going to go back up. The central banks have a put. I think that's totally wrong what the central banks are doing this intervention, but you know, I don't have a vote in. And so what, what's your opinion I, then? What's your opinion then on, on the, uh, VIX then and the leverage short volatility trade basically accelerating the buy the dip mentality? It, it is. It's certainly accelerating it. It's another way for investors to profit from by the dip. It has been the greatest investment for the last 10 years. But as we saw in one day, 10 years of gains are wiped out. Uh, it's a tool that very few people understand. Uh, it's a concept that very few people understand, implies volatility. But many people are involved. And, and I'm not just talking about individuals. I'm talking about pension funds, institutions that also are looking at easy money and just saying, yeah, let's just do that trade. Um, and, and that's, that's, you know, one of the, one reason why this top may be very sharp like 1987 because like portfolio insurance back then we have something that generates selling pressure as it as it um, in the case of VIX rises and it's going to put undue pressure on the cash indices uh, because when people have to cover it it just basically multiplies it on itself uh, reflexive so to speak. Uh, so now your comments about the Federal Reserve, I couldn't agree more. I, I don't necessarily think they should be gone, but I think we should never even, they should be so far out of the limelight that we should barely even pay attention to them. Most people should not know the chairman of the Fed's name, let alone them be heroes and on the cover of time. Um, I think it's totally ridiculous. Um, an economy is based on supply and demand, and supply and demand is based on the needs, wants, desires, how hard someone's willing to work. That's where supply and demand both come from. Now, when a central bank or a government, for that matter, starts dictating prices, which they're doing through interest rates, they are essentially telling us as consumers, as workers, that we don't know what we want, that they are warping those decisions. They are taking those decisions out of our hands. They are not forcing us, but uh, pushing us to make decisions that we don't necessarily want to make. And as far as saving the world in 2008, I think they delayed the inevitable and probably made it a lot worse. Um, at some point, you got to take your medicine. You can kind of think of the economy as, in general, I like to think that it rises, it grows over time. But because of human behavior, it cycles. So if you kind of think about a line going up at a 45 degree angle from the bottom left to top right, the economy tends to underperform and overperform kind of like a wave pattern. And what the Federal Reserve needs to do is let those patterns play out because inevitably they correct themselves. But unfortunately, the Fed doesn't believe it doesn't seem to believe in recessions anymore. Apparently, it's their job to prohibit recessions. And in doing so, they're making the next recession 
that much worse. Keynes, Keynes believed that he could end recessions with Keynesian economics and countercyclic uh, stimulus plans, but he also said that during the boom times, during the good times when the economy was doing well, the government should build up a surplus. And so no government right. has really built up a surplus. But instead, you just have massive amounts of either tax and spend or borrow and spend from government. And so, you know, instead of allowing a recession, which is good, bankruptcies are good, uh, excess needs to be cleared out, malinvestment needs to be cleared out. If you ran your company horribly, you're a parasite or you made bad invest company or bad mergers and acquisitions. And we'll talk about this later in the interview with your excellent articles on financial engineering with some of the large publicly traded corporations that are going on right now. You know, if you're doing that and the central bankers didn't have your back, you deserve to go bank. But that's not being uh, allowed. Toys, right. Toys R Us is a good example who finally did go bankrupt. That's a company. My kids are a little bit older now, but when they were little kids, you know, in the, the uh, 2000 to 2008 kind of era, everyone thought I'd have to go in on Toys R Us. It was the most awful experience <laughs> ever. The stores were a mess. The customer service was horrendous. It was just an awful experience, and they should have gone under. Uh, but there was very little competition in the toy business until Amazon came along. And Amazon, sh you know, should have pushed them out of business a while ago. But the Fed manufactured lower the rates. And it allowed companies like Toys R Us to stay in business longer. Uh, eventually they did go out of business because even lower rates couldn't save them. But, 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 but what, but what we really need to consider is, well, how much money went into Toys R Us that could have funded something that was more productive, be it, uh, cure for cancer, be it, uh, labor training, be, you know, all kinds of different things or a new project at a company, uh, maybe like a Tesla, uh, electric cars. I mean, who knows what it could have been? new source of energy uh and that money was denied denied a more productive investment well, and and that this isn't just about toys r us there are a host of what what we call zombie companies that are sucking up funds that can be better used and and to add to your points there the artificially cheap money and credit from the central bankers with financial oppression it also allowed and this might be just a specific toys r us case although there are some other companies that have that have been victims of this so toys r us probably was operationally run bad but the toys r us specific cases that private equity came in with cheaper debt and they then proceeded to strip the assets load the company with debt pay themselves huge salaries mm -hmm. and then you know it was a zombie company after that and it was a question of when and not if the company was going to go bank. So, you know, right, the they LBO'd it. Yeah. So the private equity firms, because of this extra debt, they there's been enormous successes there with restaurants and retail where they've like stripped a lot of quality companies. They've totally mismanaged them in order to strip the ass, pay themselves more money, shorter, fast, uh, more money right. in shorter amounts of time. So right. let's let's talk about some of this financial engineering since we're kind of on the, 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 that topic right now. So you put out a couple months ago this excellent article on McDonald's, and I think it was so good, Michael, that Jim Chanos, the legendary short on Wall Street, I think he, he read it. I think it got around there so much that I think he read it. <laughs> And he recently announced that, and he recently announced that he very heavily short McDonald's and some of the other fast food. So talk about, you know, what McDonald's has been doing with, uh, the zombie finance and financial. Uh, basically McDonald's, I, I looked at McDonald's. This was, I think I put the article out, uh, around Halloween last year. And I took a, some reason I took a look at McDonald's. And it was, uh, had taken an unbelievable run from, uh, from about 29 to 2014 or so. It was trade in a range, but it was relatively flat. And then from about 2014 on, it went from 100 to, uh, called about 180. And I was like, this is McDonald's we're talking about. It's a company that we all know. This isn't uh, a more complex company. We know exactly what they do. We know that their products are saturated. In other words, they're not opening that many stores. They're great growth rate can't be that high. And so I decided to look into it. And what's fascinating is that over the course of the last four or five years, their revenues have been flat. So I was right that the company was not really growing. Revenue, I mean sales. So their sales really aren't growing. Um, I look, you look into it further and you realize that their shares, number of shares outstanding are declining. So what the company is essentially doing is buying back shares by issuing debt and buying back shares. Uh, its PE is high. 
it's just a very overvalued company. And when people see the stock price rising, they jump on because it must be a great thing. And, and believe me, there's plenty of McDonald's out there. This isn't McDonald's just happened to caught my eye. And then we wrote an article right after that where we, we pointed out 10 to 15 other companies that are in very similar shoes that are basically using share buyback uh, to promote the price of the stock, even though revenue growth has been flat to many of these declining. Companies like Procter Gamble or 3M have not seen revenue growth in years, but stock prices that are going through the roof. Yeah, McDonald's is trading at twenty five over twenty five times trailing twelve month multiple price to earnings. So, and I'm sure, right, right, right. This is a company that's not growing. Right, think about that. You know, those companies should be trading at PEs in a low double digit. Yes. Why would you pay that type of premium for a company not growing? You're you're you don't care about the long term. You're not looking at fundamentals. You're only looking at momentum. Uh, or the other scenario is you're a pension fund or you're a retiree. And because of, you know, financial repression from central bankers, you are absolutely desperate for, you're desperate for that 2.5% dividend yield from McDonald's. Yeah, but I, you know, I'd rather own a 10 year bond at 2.8% now. Uh, but that's a separate story. But you could buy a treasury bond, which in theory is risk free at a higher yield than that. So if the yield was 4%, I think maybe, maybe that's a dividend story. Some of it may be a dividend story. The other story is is it's a passive investing story. So there's an increasingly a ma- n- big number of investors that are moving from active, where you actually pick and choose companies, those that have high valuations you shun, and those that are cheap you buy, uh, to just buying what's in the index. And with the advent of ETFs and index funds, McDonald's is one of those companies that's in a ton of indexes and a ton of ETFs, and it just gets bought. You know, some, you know, I'm sure you can find McDonald's in both growth and value ETFs. Well, it's either one or the other. It's certainly not a growth company based on their revenues, but I'm sure it's in some growth ETFs. And so these investors are blindly buying the SPY, for instance, the S&P 500. But within there is McDonald's. So they are they are one class of investor pushing up the price of McDonald's uh, without even knowing what they're doing, without having no concept. And most of these ETFs, because they're so simple, can be run by a simple algorithm that, that pretty much anyone can create with a spreadsheet. So this passive investing fad is creating just gross distortions in valuation. Do you think, Michael, that over 50% of the S&P 500 and a large percentage of the Dow as well is doing similar games to McDonald's? Um. Well, there's a lot of buybacks going on, and we've talked about that before. And buybacks, buybacks have a purpose. I don't think buybacks are necessarily a bad thing, but when the stock is trading well above its intrinsic value, I don't think there's any place for buybacks. And of all people, Buffett has said as much, even though he owns companies that are buying back their shares uh, that are well above their intrinsic value. Uh, to me, when a company is buying back its shares, it's a company that really has no growth prospects, that has nothing to invest in. So it's basically buying back its shares as another way of paying a dividend, sort of a, a, a tax-free dividend, if, if you may. Um, well, the, the, other, the other thing about the buybacks is there's a couple reasons, in my opinion. We've discussed this at length, too, in the past. So, you know, you have management, which is trying to play the beat quarterly earnings game so they can get rich quick and trigger their stock options. And, and the other reason with the uh, share buybacks is, is that they're u- the other thing that really bothers me with the share buybacks is they're not using free cash flow. They're using debt. So I, I, d- I have a big distinction right. between share buybacks with free cash flow, which is basically like a dividend to shareholders and share buybacks with debt. Because if you're using, look at ExxonMobil, look at some of these other companies that have done too many share buybacks for tens of billions of dollars at high. ExxonMobil started their share, share buy, buyback program, I think, 15 or 20 years ago when the oil price was much higher uh, than now. And so their balance sheet is saddled with debt and their share price is lower and they still have to pay back the debt. So in the short term, the shareholders maybe did did better than they should have. But in the long term, if you held those ExxonMobil shares, you're not better off from the, all those uh, many years of share buybacks with tens of billions of dollars debt. Right. Right. Here's the problem, Jason, is that shareholders are very short term oriented. And no one can, no one seems to care about the corporate earnings 5, 10, 15 years from now. If they cared, they'd be buying companies that were investing in their future, that were, that were possibly even taking losses today because they're investing in the future. But that's not the case. 
And if you want to know why productivity in this country and most other countries around the world is quickly grinding to productivity growth is quickly grinding to a halt, that's one of the reasons. It's because we're so short-term oriented, we can't make those investments for the future. Amen. Um, and and it, this isn't just about McDonald's. This is about the effect that all the McDonald's will have on the world, uh, on yeah. economic growth. And that gets to the prosperity of everyone, not just McDonald's shareholders or the very wealthy, but yeah, we, we but call everyone. This, we call this uh, myop, uh, myopic rent-seeking. So it's, the economic term is rent-seeking, where people only fo- focus on short-term outcomes. So they try to maximize exactly. every single person profit in the short term like with this leverage short volatility trade right, okay exactly. you're making okay you're making um, a profit right now in the short term and it's, it's this the problem is again this isn't about mcdonald's or mcdonald's shareholders because if it was i could care less the problem was this is about our future and my kids and they are destroying the future economy and because we can't see the future economy no one seems to care but they will and by then it's too late we'll be right back with michael Leibowitz after a word from our sponsor Do you work out routinely and eat healthy almost all the time? If you eat paleo or vegan or work out routinely, you may be eligible to save up to 33% off on your life insurance thanks to Health IQ. Health IQ is a venture capital-backed, big data technology, life insurance company that offers customers life insurance at special rates by using the latest technologies. For more information, please go to healthiq.com forward slash WS, the number four, MS. That's healthiq.com forward slash WS, the number four, MS. Without the share buybacks, and there's been well over $1.4 trillion in share buybacks with debt since the 2008 financial crisis, Michael, I think we'd be potentially be looking at, you know, 40 times earnings for some of these large stock market indices like the Dow or the S&P if you, t- if you backed out all the share buybacks debt. It's, it would be astronomical valuation. No one in their right mind would pay those except for momentum traders. No value investing person would, in their right mind would pay those type of valuations. And that's why value investors right now are getting killed. Right. Right. Uh, well, right. It, 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 it just distorts everything. It makes uh, price earnings look a little better, look a little cheaper, but it, it's wrong because what it's not capturing is future earnings loss, and that's so, because they're not investing in the future. So let's transition now to deficits. You just put out a, a new article saying deficits matter. Uh, I just watched today, literally on Thursday afternoon, a couple hours ago, there was an economic advisor that President Trump appointed, and he spent a good 20 or 30 minutes uh, at the communications booth area in the White House talking to reporters, explaining to them how su- their supply-side economic stimulus with the tax cuts is going to work so well. So uh, t- talk about talk about the deficits now and what you think the end result's going to be. You think it's going to be a weaker dollar going forward and a lot more inflation? Uh, first of all, we're, we're talking about trillion-dollar deficit. When you go back to 2008, we ran a couple, two, three years of trillion-dollar deficits, and this nation was scared to death. It was a financial crisis. We were, uh, you know, had minus 3 4% GDP for a few quarters. We're, we're growing at 2 3% real right now. Unemployment's the lowest it's been in a long time. I'm not saying the economy is going crazy, but the economy is decent right now. And we're going to run trillion dollar deficit that you need to ask who's going to fund these deficits. Uh, they do need to get funded. I know it, it, I know it's popular to just assume they get funded, but at some point they need to get funded. Um, and what we wrote about in the article is that the foreigners who traditionally own about 40 to 50 percent of our debt on the margin are not buying more. So that's a problem. The Federal Reserve is actually reducing their supply of treasuries. That's a problem. So the, the problem is, is not will they not get funded? They'll get funded, but at what interest rate? And when you're in a very over leveraged economy, that question matters. So, uh, you know, I'll see people on Twitter or other people say, well, take a look at the 10 year chart. It's up, but compared to like the 30 year history, it's just a blip on the screen. And nominally, they're correct. It's, it, you know, it's not up that much, but they're not factoring in leverage and how much the amount of leverage has increased. And that's, that's the big mistake. And, you know, I heard, I heard a comment something around 1987 that 
that it took interest rates rose sharply in 1987, about from 7% to 10%. And someone claimed that that's what set off the market. And then they were trying to say, well, look, it can go up three more percent. And that's a big mistake because 1987, there wasn't that much debt. Today, there is multiples and multiples. And I'd be shocked if we can go up to to three and a quarter percent without creating massive economic or big economic problems. So it's not a, it's just, it's not, not a question of who will buy it, but at what price will they buy that debt? At some point it may be, go ahead. I I would also question what the Fed is saying, how they're going to reduce their balance sheet and they're not going to monetize debt. They're not going to sell that, that they're going to sell off all these assets because they were claiming in 2017 that they were going to start doing that. And from the evidence we've seen, they really haven't done that. So they have raised risks rates a little bit and but i think that the federal reserve in the global macroeconomic situation they didn't do qe but they actually benefited from bank of japan and european central bank and china pumping massive amounts of liquidity into their own economies and doing and into asset prices and we in 2017, both of those three central banks did enormous amounts of liquidity injection, and a lot of that capital, Michael, ended up back here in the United States in stocks, bonds, real estate, etc. So the Fed, that's kind of prevented the Fed from having to make some of these more difficult decisions where, you know, they actually are going to reduce the balance sheet. I, I actually personally don't think that they can meaningfully reduce the balance sheet. And by meaningfully, I mean, you know, more than just a hundred billion or more than a couple hundred billion. I, I, in the Fed's models, Michael, they're actually assuming that they can offload what a trillion dollars or more of their balance sheet. And it won't cause, right. it won't cause a stock market crash. I don't think that that, that will happen. Right. Now, I, I, I tend to agree with you, but let me propose a scenario that no one seems to be thinking about. Everyone assumes that if the stock market really falls off, or maybe even if interest rates really start rising, the Fed will come in and do more QE. And based on the last 10 years, there's no reason not to suspect that. But what if we do have inflation? Or what if the dollar is just getting hammered? Can the Fed really move to a, a more dovish policy? And that, that's potentially the scenario that is devastating to stocks and bonds where you have a Fed that actually has to act like the Fed under Paul Volcker and raise interest rates and reduce their QE holding. It, it'll be interesting to see what happens. The, the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand and they assume that the Fed acts independently is that all these central banks, uh, not every single one, because the People's Bank of China doesn't necessarily coordinate with the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan and the Federal Reserve. But the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, and the European Central Bank, I mean, they've been coordinating things, Michael, for a while now, really since the 2008 mm-hmm. financial crisis. So who who's to say that, you know, the Fed does continue to raise rates, you know, three times in 2018, maybe reduces their balance sheet a hundred billion, a couple hundred billion or something. But if on one hand, the Fed is doing that, but on the other hand, Japan and Europe are helping the Fed out and continuing on QE. And in 2017, they did over $3 trillion total of, of liquidity injections. They've reduced it a little bit. I think it's down a trillion now in 2018, but it's still a lot. And so, you know, they could go in there and soak up some of this liquidity. So I, I think that's the thing that a lot of people missed out on was coordination of central bank. I, I agree. I, I totally agree with you. And that's definitely been going on. Um, but, but again, if we do have global inflation, none of these central banks can play their games anymore because they just stoke the inflation more. And that's, you know, maybe that's what kills this whole cycle of uh, central bank manipulated uh, growth. That's why I've been saying for years now, and you and me have had a lot of lunches about this, but I was saying going forward, you know, ultimately the central banks would do a lot of different games, a lot of different types of QE and liquidity but it would result in worse and worse stagflation. We've seen the charts from the Bank of International Settlements and the 2008 financial crisis, the global debt for public and private sector has exploded. So, you know, they've, right. they've delayed the next financial crisis. They didn't, they didn't solve the next uh, financial crisis. They just delayed it with a lot more debt. And so yeah, ultimately, and I, hmm? no, go ahead. I was just going to say, ultimately, I think, unfortunately, looking at the problems and China's a mess now, China was in better shape, in my opinion, 10 years ago. They had a larger trade surplus with a lot less debt 10 years ago. Now they have a huge credit bubble in their shadow banking system and their, and, uh, the rest of their real economy. They're a mess too. China was not nearly this bad 10 years ago. And so I think, you know, the best case scenario, Michael, is going to be worse stagflation. And, you know, the worst case scenario is hyperinflation or 
you know, full debt deflation where the central banks either try to do something and fail or they don't do anything at all and let bankruptcies. And then, you know, we have uh, worse social problems uh, in the streets than we do now. You know, we have riots or people with pitchforks and, and a rapid spike in violence and crime because people, mm-hmm. you know, can't. Their ATMs aren't working, stuff like that. So right. I think, you know, they're going to, the middle solution, as, as I've discussed with you, is the stagflation scenario where they, they pretend the inflation is not as bad and they just try to keep things in a stagflation environment for as long as possible. The, the, problem, with, the problem with that, with the, all these scenarios, and we're seeing it already, you know, it's the rise of Bernie Sanders, it's the rise of Donald Trump, that people are demanding something different. And it's because it's the opioid opiate crisis. It's, this is all suffering from the lower and middle class. They're economically suffering. Their real earnings are actually declining. They can buy less, but there's so much pressure to be more materialistic and buy more. They're heavily embedded, and all these frustrations that we're seeing on both sides of the aisle, um, again, whether it's Sanders or Trump, are manifestations of this economic uh, difficulty at the lower levels. And as it worsens, we're going to see more and more uh, people speaking up and demanding something different. So you have an article that you put out around Valentine's Day called Strategies for Tomorrow. Is that, is that solutions to what you discussed then? Well, you know, one one of the things investors really need to consider is that this 60-40 stock bond uh, type portfolio that is so popular right now, 70-30 if you're aggressive, 50-50 if you're not, uh, what if stocks and bonds both sell off in unison? You know, you have to have something else in mind. And, and in that article, I list uh, six or seven different options on ways to manage money that are not dependent on the price on the price of stocks going up or the price of bonds going up. Um, I I really think that the next 10, 15 years is not going to be like the last um, the last 30 or 40 years where investors have been able to get away with this uh, stock bond uh, parity type portfolio. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I When I have paid consulting work uh, and I have clients who have a couple hundred thousand dollars minimum, you know, I tell them that you want to start taking money out of the regular stock market so you can keep some in. But, you know, a lot of those people are looking for income. So you basically, in order to find that, you have to look for rental properties that are outside the stock market. You have to be maybe invest in a uh, in a small business that's not on an exchange. There's there's options there now. There's crowdfunding if you want to be more aggressive and take more risk with a startup. There there are options outside of the conventional uh, capital markets because I think you know so much of this central bank liquidity since 2008 and there's tens of trillions of dollars in liquidity f- floating around. It's really caused the valuations and everything the everything bubble. The valuation of pretty much everything is ridiculous now and way out of whack. I mean, we've talked about this with the stock market valuation. This is one of the four most overvalued stock markets of all time. And we have talking heads on CNBC and Bloomberg telling people to buy every single dip for the long term. Right. I would actually argue this stock market is more overvalued than any other we have ever seen, uh, or at least seen since, you know, since the late 1800s, because you can't just look at a valuation. So the price to earnings on, uh, or the Cape price to earnings in uh, the late 1990s hit the low 40s. We're only in the low 30s now. So you could say that the, the valuations of the late 90s were, were much higher and that there's still room for this market to run. And just looking at those numbers, that's a fair comment. But what you're missing out on is the fact that the economy in the late 90s was much better, growing at twice the rate it's growing now, that the government was actually ran a ran some surplus that the overall level of debt in both corporate, individual, and government debt was much lower. So when you put it on an apples-to-apples basis, our valuations now basically are what you're paying for what you're going to get are horrendous unless you think that the economy can grow at 5, 6, 7% for the next 10 years and reverse the trend of the last 40 years. I so- personally see nothing that that tells me that the that the overall trend, it doesn't mean we can't get some good quarters or some bad quarters, but the overall trend in my mind, because of demographics, because of productivity growth, and because of the burden of debt, to me just signals that the growth rate of the economy will continue its downward trend. I'm not as familiar with studying the historical period from the late 1800s for the stock market, but I am, but I have studied a lot of different uh, financial history and especially economic bubbles. And what this reminds me of the, the year 
right now, the last year or two, it reminds me mostly, Michael, of 1927. So 1927 was, you know, World War One had been, had already happened a while before, and so a lot of money, uh, the governments had cheated on the gold standard, and they were pretending that there was another gold standard, and they were all creating enormous amounts of money and credit. We had the Roaring Twenties, so there was a big mm-hmm. boom. Uh, there's a huge boom right now in China. It's a happy phase of the boom. They will have a bust in the future. I don't know exactly when, but there's been huge booms in a lot of these economies with the artificial intervention from the uh, central banks. And during 1927, like those couple years, the U.S. was doing better than a lot of the other economies because back then the U.S. was like the fastest growing economy because we we're, you know, build it. We we're, I think the uh, Empire State Building was built in a year. You know, the U.S. was unbelievable with its manufacturing and industrial powerhouse back then. Mm-hmm. And so like a lot of money flowed into U.S. the capital markets back then. And I'm seeing like a lot of the same thing. Despite all these other central banks doing enormous liquidity programs, a lot of that money in those other countries has come into us, which reminds me of what happened, you know, with 1927, 1928. A couple years before the Black Tuesday, October 1929, uh, October 29th, 1929 crash. So I, I don't want to say that we're going to have a stock market crash anytime soon, like a month or six months or anything per se, but we're setting things up pretty badly where the valuations, you can't, you can't, trees don't grow all the way to the sky. You can't have McDonald's at 40 times or 50 times, times earnings without a crash. It's, I, I don't think we're going to get there. Right. The other thing is that markets just don't correct over periods of time. That valuation is going not correct over time. So, so you can make the case that price that if earnings can keep growing at five percent, eventually price to earnings can get back to a normal level. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Um, so, I I agree with you. Uh, you know how it plays out and how severe it is. I don't know, but I know that paying these kind of valuations for an economy that that's growing at two to three percent. And keep in mind, the government is spending a trillion dollars deficit, net spending a trillion dollars. That goes straight, that almost every penny of that goes straight into the economy. So flip out the government spending and we're in a recession already. Well, as an Austrian school economist, Michael, I would say that there was no real recovery after 2008. So there yeah, was I'm no actually, real, like the asset right. prices not, went crazy. Hmm? No, I, I'm working on an article that basically shows the economy has been in recession since 2008 once you strip out the government fiscal uh, spending. And and despite the, uh, the shale boom, Michael, now U.S. having record amounts of oil production, which according to some estimates are more than even Russia and Saudi Arabia now, the U.S. is still running massive trade deficits. So this is this is scary stuff. The budget deficits are starting to explode. The dollar is getting cur. Uh, what do you think about the the bond market, Michael? Do you think then? Now you've talked about. You said that you think ten year bonds are safer right now than McDonald's. But what if there's a bond bear market? Wouldn't that be dangerous to be in bonds as well? Do you think the bond bear market yeah. has started? Uh, no. I mean, I still I still lean on the thought that bond yields can still go much lower, as hard as that seems to believe. And I, I think the problem with the whole economy and the market is that higher yields are a huge problem to the economy. So at some point, yields get to the point where it destroys economic growth and it starts hurting the economy. The Fed starts lowering rates. And I think the flight back to quality, you know, you can call it quality or not quality, but the flight to treasuries is on again like we've seen in the past. Now, this may be the last time we go back lower, and it may be, the you know, that low in yield may be the beginning of the ultimate bear market, but I think there's at least one more nice run lower in yield ahead of us. That's interesting. And do you think, it seems that correlations are getting kind of screwed up now. So, you know, in the past, if central banks, especially the Federal Reserve, was raising interest rates, that would normally mean a strong dollar. But, you know, despite the, uh, despite the Federal Reserve in 2017 raising interest rates, the dollar in 2017 on the dollar index did not do well. So do you think then that correlation between the Federal Reserve raising rates and a stronger dollar is broken? I don't think it's broken, I think. So you're right. Economically and monetary policy wise, the dollar should be rallying. Uh, the problem is, that we're contemplating, you know, we will have trillion dollar deficits. And at the same time, Trump's new budget is going to add hundreds of billions to that. It, uh, you know, it's not going to be passed as is. But talk of infrastructure plans and even more spending is ridiculous. And I think countries are saying enough. We're not funding your excessive growth anymore. Uh, so, so you're, you know, you, you kind of have a supply demand problem going on as well. And you, I think that Michael, you forgot the other 300 billion dollars that the military is getting so 
I mean, like over the next couple of years. So, I mean, it's right. they're they're obviously there's I'm I really do not like the U.S.'s global military empire. I think it's way too big, too bloated, waste too much money. It oppresses people. It kills innocent women and children in other countries. And I agree a lot with Ron Paul that if we weren't over there, but there are some things for defense that do need spent on. But I mean, to not work on cutting back and be willing to spend an extra three hundred billion dollars in a short amount of time is ridiculous. Well, and uh, yeah, like here, you said, other, is... other countries are are they really going to other countries let us fund that that uh, military spending? So that's a big question. Here's a discussion for another day because this this can take up a full forty five minutes. One of the biggest things that we export is defense of many countries, Japan, Europe, to name a few. That is the only reason we can run these deficits is because these countries need to use dollars because they want to be defended. And I think that paradigm is coming to an end. Um, but in order to do that, we need to create trouble in the world to make the Japans and the Europe's understand that they need our help. And in order to have our help, they need to use the dollar. And that's a big, big issue. Um, to the neocons then starting like proxy wars and all this other ridiculous inter- Prevention stuff. I'm really. I uh, you live in DC around DC area too, so you know all these stupid neocons and their think tanks talking about. Oh, we need to intervene in this country and do that, and we need to get rid of this president and do all and interfere in this election. It's it's totally ridiculous. Right. A hat tip here to Luke Groman, who I think has this dollar situation uh, just a great feel for it. But one of the things that he asked and it's hard to come up with a different answer is why did we go back into Iraq in 2000, uh, you know, 2001, 2002? They didn't invade, they weren't in charge of September 11th. They had nothing to do with it. And if you go back and look, Iraq, just a little before that, had threatened to start trading oil in euros. That, that's, the petrodollar that, that's was part of it back then, but the petrodollar isn't as big of a deal now as it was, uh, you know, 17 years ago. The other thing was George W. Bush, his dad had been badly embarrassed by Saddam Hussein during the Persian Gulf War. And so that grudge was a family grudge. So supposedly George W. Bush for 15, 20 years had been talking about even when he was governor of Texas, if he ran for president, he was going to get Saddam back for embarrassing his dad. Right. right. I obviously, mean, you know, you there's know, other reasons, but yeah, I think and, a and lot of the, this comes down to the dollar. Well, the do- the dollar is everyone's problem right now, right? Because we flooded not and but well, you and me didn't do it, but the people running the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury, the people in power, the economic and political elites here in D.C. and Wall Street. They flooded the entire global economy with tens of trillions of dollars in dollars. The U.S.'s best, best export, Michael, for for 40 or 50 years has been, you know, dollars, offshoring either paper dollars or digital dollars. That's right. That's right. Well, and that's not a sustainable policy, though, and that's, I think, what we're going to be learning over the next 10 years. So l- let's talk about some investment options, and then I want to get your opinion on a couple, one or two other things before we wrap up this interview. So the Emerging Markets ETF, Michael, had the Vanguard Emerging Markets ETF has almost doubled since January 2016. That was really before the dollar started to tank because the dollar started to tank. The dollar was actually pretty strong in 2000. It was th- early 2017 when the dollar started to really die. So why do you think then the emerging markets have been uh, doing pretty good on the uh, on the TF investment? And do you think that will continue? Or do you think then that if there is a debt crisis, that that would be something that would uh, that would stop very quickly? So. You know, we have seen this for the last 10 years where the cheapest securities all of a sudden become the most popular securities and get run up to very high levels. And I just think, you know, emerging markets finally caught a bid. And and given that you can't make any yield and fixed income and that stocks are at such high valuations, emerging markets look relatively cheap. And investors, like they've been doing, are falling all over themselves to buy anything cheap without even really understanding what they're buying. As far as their future performance, a lot lot depends on the dollar. If the dollar can start to rally, that those gains are going to be erased relatively quickly. If they're all reliant on dollar funding, and that's really going to cost them. But if the dollar stays cheap, that makes their dollar funding that much cheaper. Um, that's a great. That's a great point. Yeah, there there are governments in the emerging markets. Many governments there, and many large corporations in the emerging markets have way over borrowed in U.S. dollar denominated terms. The other thing is 
I think those emerging markets, Michael, are way too dependent on China. So exporting either metal or agriculture or other types of commodities uh, to China. So, you know, China has been really booming the last couple of years. And we have hedge fund. Ma- I think Kyle Bass is a brilliant guy. He nailed the uh, credit default swap and subprime mortgage trades. But really for the last years, as brilliant as Kyle is and uh, how logical it is uh, for China to collapse and have again uh, a RMB devaluation, it hasn't happened wrong. So, you know, as long as China's booming, I think the emerging markets with that dollar are going to benefit, but that trade could reverse and then things are going to be ugly. Right, right. I agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what's been interesting in this, over the last 10 years is that the Fed and the other central bank have made very logical arguments that have historically always made sense, have turned them upside down, and guys like Kyle Bass look look to be wrong, even though they may be, they may not have got it, but I think eventually they will be proven right. And we are seeing this uh, with a good number of value investors that, that or macro investors that really have a great feel for everything, but just we're seeing asset prices defy gravity. Zach Hendry is a really well-respected hedge fund manager, made a lot of money. He's had a bad last couple years out of a, you know, great long-term track record. He shut down his fund. He may restart it, but, you know, I think a lot of these guys, they don't, they don't understand the macroeconomic picture quite as well because, you know, I, I've listened to Kyle Bass and also economists say that China has to devalue the RMB by some people have an exact estimate by 18 to 20 percent and that they should have already done it. But just because they have to eventually do it at some point doesn't mean they can't delay it for another couple. So at some point, you know, China with this artificial credit boom, they're going to have to do bank bailouts, in my opinion. They're going to have to do currency devaluation. Uh, shareholders of some of these large state owned enterprises where there's enormous waste and they've over borrowed in dollar terms, like you were talking about emerging markets, those mm-hmm. shareholders of those state owned enterprises may get wiped. But timing of these things is very, very difficult difficult. So I, I think that's that's the major issue there. If you're trying to time these things, you could get the fundamentals right and be totally off on the timing. Right. I agree. I agree. Well, um, and, you know, and now now I think there's a little more geopolitical risk seems to be on the rise, which just makes all of that much harder. Well, Michael, in, in wrapping things up then for obviously not investment advice, but in your opinion, do you think people then should uh, should have cash on the sidelines and gold and silver and maybe what other what other types of uh, hedges or investment things? like retail investors or hedge fund managers have? I think people should consider an allocation to gold, silver, uh, which, you know, I'm not going to put a number on that. Uh, I think that they should start considering hard commodities, uh, which are just grossly depressed. Uh, I think they should think about inflation, uh, inflation type hedges. And I, there is there is very little inflation now, and I'm not saying there will be some, but that inflation can be one of the things that just kills people. Um, I I think there's, you know, you should be formulating an exit plan for stock, whether you decide to sell a little bit every two weeks or whether you decide to uh, sell it in chunk, uh, you know, some today, some tomorrow, whatever it may be. Think about your exit plan and don't get caught when everyone else is trying to exit. Uh, I'm comfortable in bonds. Uh, I don't know how far out the bond credit risk spectrum I'd be so comfortable, but I would Think about ways in which you can pick up some yield uh, without taking too much risk. Um, When you look at things like junk bonds, they are ridiculously expensive. Uh, But I think as you move to the higher quality corporate paper, treasuries, um, that while while the yield is not a lot, there's relative value there. But in general, I would I would start thinking and planning about more alternative alternative investment investments whose prices whose values do not depend on the stock and or bond market going up we live in very difficult very difficult terms of social unrest political uh, geopolitical and basically the rules change so you know the central yeah. banks could change their mind or the treasury departments or governments can change their mind and um, it's it's very difficult the average person who doesn't spend a lot of time on this really has to figure out who to trust and that's going to be a very difficult environment because like you said earlier in the interview, I think you mentioned a bunch of times, uh, you went into more detail than I am now, but what worked in the past, you know, with the, the traditional mix, stocks and bonds, probably is not going to work. And that's like modern portfolio. And that's so hard to accept because it has worked for most people's investment lifetimes. Well, Michael, if our listeners want to follow more of your work at either 720 Global or 
the new partnership with Real Investment Advice or your newsletter, The Unseen, how do they do so? They can. Uh, well, so The Unseen, we are publishing only to existing subscribers. We're not taking new subscribers. At Real Investment Advice, we will be coming out with a newsletter. Uh, we're working with our web web developers and hope to get that out over the next few weeks. That will not only be a uh, articles like we're doing now, but we'll also have uh, allocations, models, very various other uh, tools to help investors invest. Uh, it'll have our latest thoughts on investments. It'll have uh, podcasts, possibly, possibly some interviews as well. We'll get you on board, Jason. Uh, so you can follow us at real invest, realinvestmentadvice.com. You can find all of my articles, Lance's articles, and a bunch of other uh, writers' articles as well. Well, thank you for your time. It'll be very interesting to see what happens in the next six months, especially with these budget deficits starting to blow up. I mean, oh boy. And the dollar, <laughs> the dollar, I mean, on the chart, I don't know if you've looked at the dollar index charts lately. The dollar index is having a little bit of a rally today, but there's mm-hmm. not a lot of, there's not a lot of support, Michael, for the dollar on the dollar index until about 79. So if we go, if we go from around 89 ish or so right now to around 79, that's going to be very good. And you also have an administrative, administration very supportive of a weaker dollar, which helps. Well, yeah, they're, they're running, they're running large scale supply side economics very late in a credit cycle where there's already a lot of credit bubble in the real economy and all over the global economy for that. Recipe for disaster. <laughs> well, our listeners should stay tuned. And, uh, and I think, you know, cash and gold, cash and precious metals are two of the safest hedges. Uh, I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> well, if, if we do have a market crash, you do want cash for buying up. So. That's a, because obviously if there's inflation, right, your cash in the long term is going to be devalued. But in the short term, you want the cash for opportunities in case something that's a quality asset. Right. I think the most important, if I, if there's one message I'd like for listeners to have, it's just plan and think ahead so that when things start changing, because they're not changing right now. But when they're changed, you know what you're going to do and you know how to react. And you may have already taken some cards off the table. Uh, so just plan ahead.